<laughs> and uh, the RDC was like, at least she has like, you know, the balls to do something like that. Right. And I was like, I started realizing like, oh, it's time to grow up. My name is Carla Lees. I was in the U.S. Navy and I served from 2007 to 2015. Um, and I was a machinist mate and I got out as an E4. So I was born in L.A., uh, born and raised in San Dimas, California specifically. Um, my childhood was pretty chill. I was an only child for about almost 10 years and an only grandchild on both sides of my family. Um, my upbringing was pretty sheltered. Um, my mom, she was, you know, really into fitness and my dad did air conditioning. So um, they just provided a really awesome childhood for me. Uh, they were pretty strict. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of that, um, you know, growing up just, you know, just being in a, in a household where both of my parents were just constantly watching me. <laughs> um, and then my brother and sister came along and then uh, that was amazing. That was great for us and just kind of shook things up. And I realized, uh, you know, I wanted to be that role model for them. Mm -hmm. um, but I was a kind of a chatty Cathy in school. So I was constantly getting in trouble mm. for talking too much and, you know, those types <laughs> of things. So. Yeah, my, both of my grandparents, uh, so my, both of my grandpas were in the military. One was in the Marines and one was in the Navy. And then my grandmother was in the Navy as well, um, wow. but they were all officers. So I saw a different side of the military growing up. Um, and then they got into law enforcement. And then my grandma went to work in aeronautical, uh, I guess, the aeronautical industry. Mm -hmm. So I looked up to them, you know, greatly. Uh, and my parents, you know, they had normal jobs. They didn't... They, since their parents were in the military, they didn't really want to join the military, but um, I've always wanted to be just like my grandpa's. And so um, that's kind of what encouraged me to join mm. the military was, you know, I see that they had great lives. And, um, but of course they went in as officers and yeah. uh, I went in as enlisted. So before boot camp, my grandmother, she talked to me, you know, she pulled me aside and she's like, oh, boot, don't worry about boot camp. Boot camp's gonna be amazing. Like you're gonna have so many friends. Uh, the moment you get there, they'll give you cookies and milk and, you know, you get off the bus and it's going to be a, just a really great experience cookies for you. Cookies and milk? Yeah. So uh. I was, you know, looking forward to that and um, <laughs> we get to MEPS and we're getting, you know, processed right before you leave or that, that whole day before or like those, I don't know, 12 hours before you yeah. leave. And I'm just getting yelled at or not yelled at, just, sh you know, shuffled around and I'm like, let's go. Okay. I can't wait to get to Chicago because <laughs> I heard cookies and milk. <laughs> and um, so I get there and we're just getting yelled at, grilled, you know, off the bus. And it's just so confusing. I think I'm like on two hours of sleep and I'm like, where's the cookies and milk? And, you know, they're yelling at us. They're having us try on like our clothes and all that stuff. And I end up putting my like sports bra on backwards and I'm getting yelled at. And I'm like, man, this is totally different from what my grandma told me. So, yeah, that was kind of, you know a huge moment in my life was wow. realizing this is not going to be like my grandparents. So was she, was she just telling you the cookies and milk thing just to keep you at ease? You I think? think, no, I think that that really was her experience because she oh. was um, essentially, she was a wave. So yeah. the first, you know, females in the military, and I think it may have been cookies wow. and milk for them in boot camp. And it probably wasn't even boot camp. It was probably like just a training course yeah. or something. But yeah, so um, they were all, you know, officers, like I said, so they had a definitely different experience than I did. Did you eventually say, hey, grandma, I didn't get no cookies and milk in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, now she's, you know, she's a very like Martha Stewart like woman after the military. So yeah. when I told her that, she's like, I'll make you your cookies and milk. Yeah, and I'll nice. Say, no need for that now. But so when you went, um, when you went to go sign up, um, did you have an idea of what you wanted to do in the Navy? Oh my gosh, no. So I, uh, you know, I was in all-star cheerleading for so long and um, just a very girly girl. Mm -hmm. And I knew I, wa I wanted to study fashion and design. So I wanted to go to fit them. And I had just been having the hardest time my senior year, just staying focused. Um, and I was like, I don't think academics, I don't think I would do very well if I continued, you know, and if I went on to college. I think Cal Poly was on my radar and then fed them. And um, somebody was like, I think you should join the military. I am a whole year younger than most of my classmates. So um, I was 16 when I was thinking about joining the military. And it was specifically the Navy. And somehow they called me. I don't know how this happened, but they had my phone number. And I was like, it's a sign. I need to go to like the military, just like my grandparents did. And I think it'd be best for me. So 
I wanted to get out of, like I said, my brother and sister were so much younger than me. So just toddlers running around constantly. I'm here like going from cheer practice to like, you know, uh, running and choir. And then I had a job. So I was like, I think it's time for me to leave my little suburb. Right. And so, um, yeah, I was 16, super girly, like really long hair. I was in a hot pink juicy couture velour suit. <laughs> And I had like my purse and then I went to the, the recruiting station and the guys were like, what is this girl doing here? <laughs> and I remember like they were all staring at me and my mom, she was like, this is like, I, she, not that she didn't have faith in me, but she was like, this is just a phase. Like yeah. she just wants to be like Cadet Kelly, which was like a movie back then. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I took the test and they're like, oh yeah, you can qualify for all these different jobs. But I wanted to... I'd always been a really handy girl. So my dad worked as an air conditioning technician later on to have his own company and um, I would be in there with him and mm. I'd help him with the tools. And so I was actually pretty handy, which is crazy because again, you didn't expect that from me. So yeah, I, um, I ended up taking the test and they're like, well, do you, why do you want to be a mechanic? Like, you know, and I was like, I don't know, I just want to do that. Right. And so, um, yeah, so my senior year, I kind of already knew I was going to go into the military after that. I felt like it was a good fit. Mm. And I wrapped up everything. Um, I, like I said, I kind of had like a party phase my senior year. And mm -hmm. knowing that I was going to go to the military, I was kind of like, whatever, like, I'll, I'm going to make it in the military so, right. or I'm going to make it to the military. So I, you know, I didn't really... I didn't put my academics first, like yeah. I, I had the years before. Mm. So um, yeah, that was kind of like my introduction into the military. They told me I had to cut my hair back then. I don't know what the regulations are now, but back then you had to cut your hair like pretty much to your earlobe. Oh, wow. And I had just the longest hair, jet black hair. And yeah, I, I kind of, I think my mom said that she remembers like coming to pick me up from the recruiting station. And she said that I was crying and she was like, what did they do to my daughter? Like, what did they tell her? They must've told her something. And I was like, they told me I have to cut my hair. And she was like, are you serious? Like, <laughs> and so, um, I cut my hair, I got an A-line cut. So like, you know, like a little bob Right. and I showed it to boot camp, and then they took like the shortest part of the bob and cut my hair like all the way around it. <laughs> and I was like, this cannot be real, but yeah, that's what they did. I think they could tell like that I was, you know, a girly girl. And yeah. Like, Let's mess with they this They didn't girl. want you to be stylish in, yeah, in boot camp. Yeah, and it huh? was like all styled. And yeah, so that was pretty much, I was 16 going on 17. And then my parents had to sign that waiver for me to go. And um, yeah, I went to boot camp and I had literally the time of my life Did after you? the first day. Yeah. Yes. Um, I had a really great time. So I had just left cheer camp the like a couple weeks before. I wasn't supposed to leave till I want to say like January. And then I think what happened was my mom was fed up with me and she probably called my recruiter. She won't tell me that this is true, but I've kind of patched it together mm -hmm. and told her, told him like, get her out now. And so um, I go into my, the recruiter calls me and he's like, I need to talk to you. And so I go in and he says, you, you I think it was like Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And he's like, you're leaving Sunday. And yeah, because I ended up having like the craziest party before I left. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so that was, it was kind of just fast tracked. And then I went to boot camp and just got done doing cheer camp. So I was still in that like very like preppy mindset. Yeah. I even, this is so embarrassing. And I'm sure like some of my uh, squad or like, you know, the, the class that I was with that graduated with three members, but I did like my cheer routine for them. You did? Yes. And like my, uh, the, what were they? RDCs? They were just like, oh, and then one of them, like, so everybody was like laughing and I was like so confused because I was like, I just did my cheer routine for you guys. Like, why aren't you guys clapping? <laughs> and uh, the RDC was like, at least she has like, you know, the balls to do something like that. Right. And I was like, I started realizing like, oh, it's time to grow up. Yeah. So yeah, after that, you know, it was all good. But yeah, I really had a really great time during boot camp. It was really strict. I, I like that. Well, doing, like doing a, a cheer, I would imagine um, the physical aspect of it may have come pretty easy to you. Cause yeah, I was, I was, it was pretty easy. I mean, it's the, it's Navy boot camp. So what do you have to like yeah. run and do push ups and do sit ups? It wasn't like I had to like you know, run 20 million miles, but we did, I think the mile and a half. Mm -hmm. And, um, that was pretty easy for me. Uh, the physical aspect was cake, but the folding, the ironing, like they really mentally break you. Mm -hmm. I think that that's what it is, is more of a mental breakdown, at least back in 2006, 2007 it was. Right. And, um, I know that they have like simulators now, which is really neat. 
Um, what kind of simulators? Like the the sink, like you're flooding a ship, uh, the USS Cole, like they have all these different oh, simulators really? that they have that you go through in boot camp. Wow. Um, but back then you'd have to run to your stations, like the different uh, stations the night before you graduate. So it was a little different from like what they have now, but it was really fun. I had a great time. Uh, just, you know, the like the creases and I think that that, that was kind of a way to break you yeah. mentally. How did you get, how did you uh, wash your clothes in, in, in boot camp? We had like a net, like a white net that you'd put all your clothes in um, and you'd go and there was a washroom, like a washer and dryer. And I think there was like, I don't know, maybe like 10 washers on one side and 10 mm. dryers on one side. And actually that was one of my jobs in boot camp was to go and wash people's clothes, which, so a little, another backstory is I never did that stuff growing up. Not only did I have my mom, but we had somebody that came to help and clean the house and stuff like that. And she also helped my mom quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So I, I learned how to clean when I was in boot camp, and wow. I think I frustrated a lot of people because even to this day, I don't know how to sleep very well. <laughs> but yeah, so um, yeah, that was one of my jobs was like, I think you just, I think it's like socks go in one bag and you have yeah. to like label your clothing so that you know like when it comes back, it's yours. Yeah, I was curious if you guys um, washed them by hand or used oh, the, the, the... I think, no, I think it was all just machine mm. wash and it all smelled the same. Yeah. Like I could still kind of smell that like very cheap uh, detergent and um, that like very like heavy denim because yeah. back then it was the light blue and then the dark blue. Uh, right. What do they call them? The dungaroos or something like that. I don't know. Now it's just now it's I think it's the camo the digis. Mm. But yeah, back then it was just uh, we called them utilities. That's what they were. Right, right. Yeah. Um, did you guys have to um, stamp all your gear yeah. and clothes with your names? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So we had like to put like our, our, the last four of our social, I think it was, and our, or our last name. I can't remember that mm. part, but everything we owned was labeled. Yeah. Mm. And it was, I, it makes sense because there was like tons of people in your birthing and right. Yeah. So, um, where, uh, where'd you end up getting stations? Um, I got stationed in San Diego, which was like an hour and a half <laughs> from my <laughs> home. I tried to get stationed in Okinawa. Um, I, when I was in boot camp, I like, you know, you kind of go and select where you want to go. And I tried to pick like the furthest points from home. Not that I hated home or anything, but I wanted to go explore and I wanted to go. And that's why I joined the military was to kind of get away. And they sent me back home pretty much. And I was like, it's a sign. And then the worst part about it was they sent me to like the same ship as one of my ex-boyfriends. Oh. So I was like, this is not real life right now. <laughs> but, or yeah. Yeah. So that was he, happened. Was he still on the ship? So he had gotten off temporarily and then got back on when I like mm. maybe, I want to say like um, a couple months after I uh, reported to the ship, I was cleaning a table or I was like cleaning off my like little area and I looked up and yeah, there he was. And oh. I was like, this is, is this real life right now? Oh no. Yeah. But that was <laughs> it. It wasn't that big of a deal, but yeah. I just thought that was crazy. Like the Navy really is a small world. Right. <laughs> so um, talk to me about, you know, what, what your life was like checking into San Diego. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it was great. So, um, I think the ship had just gone back from deployment. Mm -hmm. So I show up and they're like, uh, come back in two weeks. Like they just gave me leave. What? And I was like, what? I, you know, I had been in school so long or, you know, for yeah. me, that was a long time to be away from home. I went home and then they're like, come back in two weeks and, uh, we'll get you processed in. But they, of course they like took down my information to make sure, right. you know, that they reported <laughs> that I came to the ship. But my journey to the ship was definitely a Hollywood moment because I took the train because I was like, I don't want my mom and dad to like, you know, uh, come down again and then me get sent back. Mm -hmm. So I took the train, which was I think the Metrolink or the Amtrak. I can't remember. Uh, I got dropped down in downtown San Diego. And then I was like, okay, now I, I've been this type of person where I just deal with it when I get there. Mm -hmm. And I got to downtown San Diego and I took the ferry to Coronado Island, which is where the uh, Nimitz was. And I get to the ferry and then I have like hot pink suitcases with me and I'm dressed pretty <laughs> nice. And I'm, I think I'm wearing heels because that, that was the type of person I used to be. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, have you ever been to Coronado Island? Yes. Like the air base? So yeah. like there's like the gates and you walk up, mm -hmm. you can either pedestrians go one gate and then the cars go the other gate. Right. So, um, or the other way I show up and I see like the MAs, the, you know, they're just checking people's IDs and I'm walking up in my heels after I've walked like probably a mile from the ferry oh, or wow. so. So I'm kind of tired, but I'm pushing through and I'm like walking up with all my baggage and they're like, stop. 
And I was like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Oh. And they're like, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I'm trying to get to my ship. And they're like, like, what do you, what do you mean? And I'm like, I have to report to that, to the Nimitz. And they're like looking at each other and they're like, <laughs> okay, we'll give you a ride. And then I was like, yep. Okay. So that's the last time I wear heels. They were like, are you really in the Navy? Yeah, it, I felt like it was almost like a Legally Blonde moment. But I, was, that's, I was totally picturing yeah. that. Like, what movie have I seen this in? You it know? was almost like that. And uh, I think a lot of people still remember that. They were like, we're driving by looking at this girl with her wow. like hot pink stuff. And, you know, a mechanic. I think I was the only female in my division for a majority of the time that I was on the ship. I got treated pretty much the same. It wasn't, I didn't get like special treatment or anything mm -hmm. like that. Um, but it definitely pushed me to, I guess, grow up mm -hmm. because I was very immature. Um, I was very much about myself and my image and I didn't really care about work at the time. Like I just kind of was in it for the experience. And quickly I learned that that's not the way things work in the real world. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to, you know, do your job. Uh, and working with men, they never disrespected me. They were just amazing. They they could tell that I probably needed a little more growing up. I had a little more growing up to do, and mm -hmm. they took me right under their wing. Um, my chief was amazing. He actually is from West Covina as well. Oh, wow. Um, and he just retired. He was Chief Duran at the time, and he really took me under his wing, and he was like, you need to grow up. And I was getting my nails done. I remember, like, maybe right before deployment, and I didn't want to clean something because my nails were going to get done, and he's like, go take those nails off. And that was it. And I was like, all right, it's time for me to like buckle down and get serious. I think yeah. I was just kind of still childlike. And um, I think it was the best thing that's ever happened to me was I, I was there, like meant to be there with those people right. so that I could grow up. And um, it just, you know, like I said, I grew up helping my dad with tools and mm -hmm. going to side jobs with him and learning a lot about air conditioning, which I ended up working on like um, steam pumps. I worked a lot with like valves and you know, uh, I worked right in front of the reactor. So I was a machinist mate down in the reactor department. So okay. I worked um, right in front of the reactor. We wore like little radiation uh, meters, mm -hmm. uh, TLDs. And um, that was probably my fastest introduction to like adulthood, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, I had a lot of responsibility, um, kind of just measuring the pressure gauges and, you know, uh, doing a lot of maintenance, which is like scrubbing. It doesn't sound like a lot, but you'd be surprised at how much oil builds up on those valves. Mm. And um, just, you know, learning about gaskets, learning about things that I never thought I would probably use out in the real world. Um, yeah. And to be honest, I thought I was going to be in the military for the rest of my life. Really? Yeah. And so I was like, you know, I'm going to transition out of being a mechanic to being a parachute rigger. Like that's kind of my, that was my mindset mm -hmm. was I kind of wanted to go and do something more, you know, I was down at the bottom of the ship. I wanted to be that's the type of thinking I had at the time. I want to be like doing stuff either on the flight deck or in one of those offices upstairs. Um, but I really did enjoy the grunt work when it came down to it, you know, and we kind of built a family, you know, yeah. you have your watch teams, you have four watch teams and uh, you really develop a family like aspect mm. and it's all up to you how it goes. So like I said, those guys were, became my brothers. Um, they were really, they had a huge influence on my life yeah. and like even now when they you know obviously i don't live in california i live in kansas uh we went everywhere and so sometimes they'll drive through kansas and you know they know that they we can get pizza they can stay if they have to um nice. so it's nice to have that yeah that's awesome so yeah. you still talk to a lot of them yeah we all still talk we're all friends on like facebook or linkedin yeah. a lot cool. of us uh some of them, a lot of them went to water treatment mm -hmm. or chemical treatment. Um, some of them went to the wind turbines because that's huge. Mm. Um, and it just kind of all fell into place for everybody. Mm. Yeah. Um, and you, how many deployments do you got? So we did two and then we did a bunch of like rim packs, uh, like smaller ones. Yeah. We did a lot of workups, but uh, the Western Pacific deployments were what we did. Uh, that was the Nimitz. And we went, you know, Japan. I'm trying to remember the whole thing. The last yeah. one was, so the one that, the very, very last one before we all kind of just went our own to different uh, stations was uh, uh, 2009, 2010. And it was uh, Japan, Bahrain, Japan, Bahrain, uh, Dubai, uh, Thailand, China, and maybe not in that order specifically. Mm -hmm. But then we circled back and did Bahrain and Dubai again, which we no one's going to complain about that. But 
uh, we, we got extended for three months. And before that, we did so many workups. And one of those workups, we got stuck out to sea mm -hmm. because of the swine flu. Oh, so wow. it was kind of like that COVID situation where you didn't know what the swine flu was. You just knew everybody had it. And so they quarantined like people that had flu-like symptoms or I think it was flu-like symptoms and they quarantined them. And so we all had to stay out in the middle of the ocean for like, yeah. I don't remember how long, but it just, you know, it was definitely a workup year. We had so many workups that year and then we went on like the longest deployment that the Nimitz all had those, seen. Um, the, all the places that you mentioned visiting, did you get a chance to get off and visit? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, we, you know, Japan, so I'm half Japanese. Oh, wow. and, uh, and Mexican. So um, for me, it was really exciting, but it was different Japanese people that, you know, I'm used to like the Japanese person or the Japanese people in my family look more Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, oh, okay. So they're more from like Okinawa. And we, I was in Yakuska. Uh, we partied really hard. Really? Uh, there's this place called The Haunch. And at The Haunch, it's like a skinny little street and there's just crazy amounts of bars on both sides. And so it's, you know, you've been on the ship for a month and a half at that point. Oh, and it was my birthday. That's right. So oh. I was turning 19 or I can't remember how old I was turning, but we went to like the Hard Rock Cafe and I had tons of like Jaeger bombs. Mm. And then on our way back, they're very strict, you know, um, in Japan, or I think they are, and you can't fall asleep on the planes or you shouldn't. Yeah. And that's the first thing I did was I passed out on the pl or on the train. And yeah, it was like a totally different world for Did they us. let you drink at 19 there? Uh, yeah. So that was another thing, coming back to the United States and being like, oh, uh, I can't drink now. I, yeah. I just spent like a whole year drinking uh, overseas. Wow. But yeah, so uh, that was kind of another reality check was, you know, I partied a lot for a little, or for a lot, I partied a lot on deployment mm -hmm. for those four days that you're allowed to go out and then you're back to work. Yeah. So um, that, you know, that was interesting for me to experience. So, you know, be, in, being in the military, um, we're known for uh causing drama sometimes when we go out and party, yeah. party hard and stuff when we get the time off did you ever uh, run into any type of drama being that i imagine you were kicking it with mostly males in your division and yeah. stuff right there did you well, ever i had a little group of friends they're girls like and okay. they were like i was the mechanic and then my very best friend jessica she was um a secretary for the captain so like a yeoman mm. um i don't know if that if that uh, rate still exists, but like, you know, everything's changed. Right. Um, and then we had like other friends that were like, that worked in logistics. So we were like a little group of girls, um, but half the time, you know, I'd get off the ship with the guys in my division and then we'd all kind of disperse and you'd have mm. your Liberty buddy. Right. And uh, so the drama I feel like was mainly uh, watching people have drama or yeah. like, you know, just kind of like, oh, oh no, like they're way too drunk. You just stayed clear of it. Yeah, That's you just kind of either avoid it or if you see something real bad happening, you go and help. But right. um, a lot of the drama I feel like was, uh, yeah, like couples fighting. Like, mm -hmm. you know, there's always the boat booze. So like right. the girlfriends and boyfriends, they drink too much, they're on deployment, drink too much, and then they argue over dumb stuff. So oh, you'd you see say, a lot of that. Wait, did you say boat booze? Yeah, boat oh, booze. So, so what is that? So a boat boo <laughs> is like... Um, uh, the person you meet on the ship that you end up in a relationship with. So it's like a boat boo, but it's a, I don't know, it either lasts or it doesn't last. Right. But that's what they're called. Like, oh, that's your boat boo. Like, yeah. you know. How I, often then not does it last? Um, I want to say it lasts all deployment. And then once <laughs> you get home, it somehow <laughs> doesn't really make it. Hence but, the boat boo, Yeah, right? the boat boo. Um, that was like one of the terms that people would use. And then another thing, uh, I didn't really get to see this that often because of my job, mm -hmm. but uh, people like sitting down and having like dinner together and stuff, mm -hmm. they'd call it cupcaking. Oh, really? I don't, I don't know, or cooking and joking, like yeah. little things like that. They, there was a different... Definitely like an interesting vocabulary yeah. in the Navy, like slang. Um, what was it, what was life like for you on ship? Like you, when you weren't yeah. off on Liberty? So, I mean, you'd wake up, uh, you'd muster, which, you know, that means take attendance. Uh, and it'd be in the hangar bay mm -hmm. and it would be, I think I was like 6 a.m. And um, after that, you either go to work. So we don't have a work day, but then we have watch. So watch was that four hour, it could be four hours, it could be six hour period, mm. depending on like the type of uh, work you had to do that day. 
And so my, like, let's just say I worked during the day and then I'd have like a couple of hours off. I'd go to the gym. I'd kind of get ready for watch. I'd mm-hmm. go over like the deck. So the logs that we have to kind of, you know, fill out with the information that we need to take record on. Um, and then I'd go to watch for the four or six hours, depending on what we were working on. Um, so we just rotated that. Like that mm-hmm. was our rotation. And then I'd go and run after my watch. So I'd run, there's like this thing called the dribble gym. Cause it's like a bunch of treadmills and mirrors and mm-hmm. it's like, you're, you know, like a hamster on a wheel. Right. Um, that was my like fun time, I think, or like my de-stress was, uh, going and doing that. Mm. And so, um, that was it. Like, I, I think most of the time I would eat from the vending machine or they had like this thing called, I forgot what it was called. It was like in the middle of the night, they would serve like a dinner, like a very like easy, cheap dinner type thing and, or not cheap, but like easy, uh, not the healthiest dinner. And, uh, I would be able to eat there because our our division or reactor department is known for kind of not being able to attend like breakfast lunch and dinner yeah so we just eat whenever we can because we're constantly on watch what kind of food did they serve up um i want to say it was like pasta and you had your choice of like red sauce white sauce yeah and then that was it uh that was a lot of what we ate and then chicken breast uh, or chicken sorry chicken and rices and like vegetables Mm -hmm. just very simple things that i think like the uh, chefs can make or the the galley people can make and then um and my favorite was the chicken cordon bleu but it was like a little like a little tiny thing and mashed potatoes that was probably my favorite but uh, ellen pizza we had but it was like you know like a little tiny pizza did you guys do mid rats that's what it was. Yeah, mid-rats. Okay, so that's what it, that was that midnight type. Yeah. yeah. So that's usually when reactor department would eat was mm. that. And it was like, like I said, it was like kind of like either leftovers or kind of junk food. Yeah, I, we used to love the Marines on ship. We would love mid-rats because, yeah. you know, we'd work out and everything. And we had set an alarm uh, to go off just yep. to make sure that we could go up there at midnight because we'd get the chicken nuggets yes. um, and just get a plate full. And um, I remember this dude, uh, one of my buddies, uh, Simple, was in another platoon. He showed me to mix um, mayonnaise with ketchup. And I'd oh. mix it and then just sit there and we'd just pound nuggets all night. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's mid-rats. That's what it was called. Yeah. yeah. That was when we would get our, like, our chance to eat was mm-hmm. we were going like between uh, watches and stuff. So yeah. we definitely had our work cut out for us, but it kept me, I think, out of trouble. Right. Right. What was the um, what was the most difficult thing that you've uh, dealt with while on ship or in the Navy in general? Um, the most difficult thing I think that I dealt with was obviously being away from my mom and dad. And back then, I didn't have like a family or anything like that. It was literally just my mom, my dad, my brother and sister, and my cat. Was I think that was pretty difficult for me because mm-hmm. I was still very young, mm-hmm. and. Um, I think I left at a very early age, and so I was just missing them constantly, but you get over it after a while. I know that sounds harsh, but you kind of just have to not well, you get think used about to it. it. Yeah, you, you get, used, get used, to used to it. And um, I'd still call home, yeah. and obviously emails, because that's kind of how you communicate did you, did you write at all? I wrote letters, yeah, but yeah. I knew like if I just write an email, it's you know yeah. fastest. If I, um, after I left like a, a port, um, I'd gather like little souvenirs from there and I'd send it home. Mm. So that was kind of neat for them, I think. I yeah. mean, I would be pretty pumped to receive those types of things. So, you know, I, I was just really tight with my family back then. And so uh, it was just, that was the only hard part for me was pretty much. And then also um, kind of pushing myself to be more disciplined mm-hmm. because again, I was kind of, I've always been just a free bird and yeah. very girly. And so shining my boots, making sure I look nice, uh, constantly not... I don't have my mom there to pick out my outfit or like, you know, dress me. So that was, that was an adjustment for me was yeah. leaving that sheltered life and now uh, paying for my own groceries, like mm. simple things like that, that I was just like mind blown about. But, right, right. you know, I, I've kind of been that way my whole life is I get thrown into like the wolf's den and that's just how I learn. Nice. That's the best way to learn. right? Oh yeah. 100%. Yeah. Um, did you ever experience any type of of uh, like trauma in the Navy um, or witness it? Cause you know, I've, I've interviewed um, Navy vets before and yeah. I've heard a lot of uh, uh, 
some of the flight deck workers on what oh. they've seen and stuff that happens on ship. And I'm just curious. Yeah, if, no, there's definitely a lot of like injuries that happen. Um, you know, you hear the craziest stories, but for me, I don't think I experienced any type of trauma, just very shocking things like people uh, jumping off the ship once they've had enough. Uh, like, you know, and that didn't happen every single day. That happened once in a while, but You'd be surprised, like, you know, some people can't adapt to the uh, rotation, or not rotation, like that cycle of wake up, work, mm -hmm. you know, free time for a little bit, go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Like, and then Sundays we'd have a break. So Sundays I feel like were the days when everybody like would snap or like, you know, it was just like that one day mm -hmm. where just everything would happen. Um, <clears throat> but I don't really uh, think it, I don't know how to explain it. I think it was always, there was always a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. But some people, they, they struggle with it. And, you know, they think that the easiest way was to jump off the ship. Sometimes <laughs> they'd go, yeah. Wait, just so out in the middle of the sea, think, they would just go jump off the ship? Yeah. Like, so um, one guy, and it would be over, like, dumb things sometimes, I think, like, got caught cheating on his girlfriend or something. And so he, like, ran, like, I, we were just literally taking muster one morning checking in and you just see this guy like just gun it for like the the uh aft or the end of the ship and he jumps off i oh sorry i would think in my head i wouldn't you know do that first off but if i was to jump off the ship i probably wouldn't jump off there because the propellers are down there and they're massive but he was fine he ended up getting uh like picked up by like our our uh what is it called i can't remember their names they're just like swimmers that uh -huh. go in and they'll uh, pull you out and put you on this raft. I would probably hate to be <laughs> that wow. person and getting pulled out. Because, I mean, the Sunday is when everybody rests. And so people are probably, you know, yeah. resting. And then they have to get dressed up to go pick you out of the water. Like, that sucks. And then what do they do with them? Oh, they get in trouble. They'll go to the, like, we call it the brig. Mm -hmm. So military prison, I guess. Wow. Um, and what happens there is very interesting. So, like, um, they'll get in trouble. And then they go to, you know, like their court type thing um, and they'll get their sentencing and then they'll usher them down into like this little tiny uh, like door that they're going to go into the jail mm -hmm. pretty much at this point and they'll mentally break them down. So they're going to yell at them. They're going to make them do push-ups. They're going to make them take off their uniform. They're just like complete for like it could go on to for hours wow. and uh, then they get to go to their jail cell. So. And wow. that's it. Like, and so I can't even imagine that traumatic experience. Um, I witnessed that a couple times, uh, but that's about it. What was your favorite uh, thing about being in the Navy? Um, just the experience. It honestly was the best thing I could have done for myself. Yeah. If I would have gone to college, I, and I'm not ragging on anybody, but I probably would still be home. Uh, probably still going to school or, you know, just, I know the type of person I was and I think I would have continued to be a very, uh, free bird, very princess like that was just the type of person I was. And I think going into the military, like I said, being thrown into the wolf's den, learning, you know, the traits that I learned and kind of just going on my own mm -hmm. was probably the best thing I did. Mm. Um, I love where I'm at. I think that a lot of my uh, learning experiences from the Navy have put me where I'm at now. Um, and I think that I, you know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the military. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get into transitioning. Yeah. Uh, but before we do, is there any other stories you'd like to talk about from your service in the Navy? Um, no, I think, uh, honestly, it was just, just a really great experience. Yeah. I think uh, kind of seeing it firsthand and seeing the different things, the different branches, how we all work together mm. for one mission. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, only this branch, you know, fights and stuff. But it's actually like, we're all in it together. Right. You know, we, we ride out there with you guys or with the Marines and, uh, or, you know, the armies out there fighting too. And mm -hmm. we all have a part in the big picture. Right. And so, you know, you hear it all the time growing up, my grandparents would be like, oh, you know, one's a Marine, one's, a, one's in the Navy and they'd go back and forth, but then, it's just for fun. Like yeah. it's, it's not really uh, like that, like, I guess going back and forth is just like kind of a fun thing. But once you're in the ship and you, you're there with the Marines and stuff, it's one mission. Yeah. And you know, we're all very proud to be there. Mm -hmm. And I think that that was probably very eye opening for me as well to see it all kind of 
Did like, you did you did you ever do that? Uh, like what was it? Polywog day? Oh yeah, yeah, you have to do that? yeah. Where you become a hard shell or yeah. yeah. So a I did back, that. Yeah, shell right? back. And uh, my recruiter, who actually uh, got me to go into the Navy, mm-hmm. or you know, he did all that stuff. Um, he actually was the one that I ended up. Uh, that he awarded me or whatever. Oh, really? Yeah, and then I got my ESWAS, you know, so like the little, the waves on your uniform. Mm -hmm. Um, And he actually was able to pin me for that. So it was actually really cool. I forgot about that. Yeah, my recruiter ended up getting stationed on the Nimitz uh, during the deployment. So squadrons will come on to the ship um, and he was one of them. Mm -hmm. So it was just so exciting to see him. And he was able to like tell my mom because his daughter and my sister became friends. Mm -hmm. And so it was really cool to like. Oh, wow. Yeah. What so, was that? What was that day like of you becoming a shellback? Oh my did, gosh, did it... it was very long. <laughs> I had just gotten off watch, and I went to go lay down, and I was like, "Oh, they're probably not gonna realize that I'm not up there." And I was like, you know, showered and nice and like ready for bed, and then yep, I hear like a bunch of like drums or like someone like pounding, making loud noise, and I think I'm like halfway asleep. And they just start yelling at me. And I'm like, is this like high school where you made the cheer squad or like, you know, middle school? Mm. And they're coming to like, like haze you. And it was pretty long, intense. They made us do dumb stuff, like blow water out of like the arresting gear, like hook things. And um, I think I had like, you know, the non-skid yeah. on the plane. I had like scratches from it from oh, rolling yeah. around. It was just fun. It's fun stuff for people to do. It's not that like... Uh, awful. I think some people like it and some people just don't want anything to do with it. You're wet, you're gross, you swim through sewer water or whatever it is. Bilge water, which I worked in 24-7 so it didn't really bug me. Mm. But yeah, it was pretty fun. I'll never forget that. And I think that that was a really, that that kind of boosted morale mm. for sure. Yeah. At least, I don't know, I think so. <laughs> no, those are the type of uh, things that you do together that um, uh, make your camaraderie stronger yes. between each other. I I think you know. Yeah, I like I said, I had to. I don't know. It was it was all part of like the experience, mm-hmm. and yeah. I enjoyed it. So, what was it like um, transitioning out back into the civilian oh, world? Oh my for gosh, you? I struggled. I struggled transitioning because I was so used to having a di- like just my day was always planned out. I knew exactly what I was going to do. My uh, I went straight into applying for the sheriff's department in San Diego. And at the time, my ex-husband was stationed in Washington State, and I was still in San Diego, and we had our child. She was like, I don't know, about to be one. And so, like I said, I thought I was gonna be in the military forever. Like, that was just the vision I had. But once I had a child, and then he was still in, and my mom, uh, my father had cancer at the time, so my mom was taking care of him, so I had no help with my, with my daughter, and so I was like, I think I need to get out. And I did that. But I wanted to work in law enforcement, so I went and applied for the sheriff's department. I ended up, you know, doing really well for the beginning portion, and then my ex-husband was like, can you move up to Washington? I think we can, like, you know, uh, back then we were still married. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we would have, like, a really great life, you know, um, in Silverdale. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I had always been a personal trainer on the side. So I worked at 24 Hour Fitness forever, um, and... I was doing that and I realized I could transfer up there easily and, Mm -hmm. you know, be a trainer and finish my uh, bachelor's and, you know, okay, so that sounds like a really great life, you know, have a family, it'd be normal. And so I went and did that and I left kind of just my dreams of being like my grandfather, you know, back Mm -hmm. there. And so I went and moved to Washington State and uh, things weren't as smooth as I had envisioned them in my head. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to work at a skate shop before I left uh, and so I figured I'll just go work at a skate shop in the mall. So I was building skateboards for a while while I was going to school and doing personal training and realized I have to do all these different things to make the same amount that I was making in the Navy, which, you know, it wasn't much, but with dual income it was enough. And so um, I'd have to drive to pretty much Tacoma to go to school. And uh, that was pretty far. That was yeah. like, what, an hour and a half, I think, or yeah. almost two hours in Seattle yes. traffic, part yeah. of it. And so it was a struggle. It was a, lo- it was a huge struggle for me. And um, I had a baby. I had a uh, husband at the time. And it was definitely a, a hard moment in my life. And then I pretty much, you know, things didn't work out between my ex-husband and I. And so I was like, I think I'm going to go back to California. So I moved back to California and, you know, I'm still doing personal training and I go back to work for the, or to apply for the sheriff's department. Now I'm back in LA. So the sheriff's department in San Diego, um, you know, they, 
I think they wrote me like a really great letter, a really nice letter. I made friends with them down there. And uh, I went through the sheriff's, into the sheriff's uh, academy. academy. Mm. I get to like the first part of it. And then my ex-husband again, he's like, hey, I think that, uh. you know, we moved, he moved to Oak Harbor. So he got, he moved from Silverdale, Washington to Oak Harbor to a different duty station. And so we went there. Um, so again, I leave my life, you know, get so far and then it happens again and we move up there and once again I'm doing personal training and going to school full time and um, then he decides he's going to get out of the military which he told me he was going to stay in forever uh. and so that's why I got out so I was kind of upset and bummed. Well and yeah then, you were in the middle of the sheriff's academy? Like, oh well, like just no just the beginning part of it not not. No but you've you've gotten accepted into yes, the and so, sheriff's academy. Yeah I went to the polygraph everything and yeah it was just I felt like in my head, you know, you want, as a female, or maybe not just a female, but as a parent, you want the best for your child. Yeah. And so you're just like, I can make it work. Like, and so I went and did that. I tried, didn't work out for me. Um, and so then I, you know, uh, packed my stuff up, moved to Washington again for the second time. And I loved Washington. So it was kind of exciting for me every time. He gets out of the military a couple years after, I think we were there for like maybe four years. Mm -hmm. So my daughter's about to be five going into kindergarten. We uh, decide we're going to move to Kansas. He's going to work in the wind turbines, which was probably the best thing for him. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy for him because he loves that. You know, he's still there. Mm -hmm. And um, I go and do personal training because, again, that's the only consistent thing in my life at this point. And now I'm finally done with school. So at least I have that. Mm -hmm. And so I go into this amazing community. It's Dodge City, Kansas. Very similar to San Dimas, California. Just a western equestrian type rodeo town. Um, and I really was like, this is actually like the best thing. Mm. And my daughter's happy. Um, since my brother and sister are so young, they don't have children yet, but his family, they have tons of cousins. Mm. So my daughter's absolutely thriving. She's happy. She's going to school with her cousins, which like you she'd never thought that that would be something that's possible. Nice. So, um, I ended up working, you know, in the community. So I'm a membership director at that time at the YMCA. Never been inside of a YMCA before. So mm. You know, I just knew 24 hour fitness and then anytime fitness, they have those out there. So I was personal training there and then finally got like a real grown up job working in uh, like as a director for the Y and then um, we get divorced. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, things happened. And, um, you know, I'm like, wow, I literally have nobody here. But that community was so supportive. Mm -hmm. Like they all rallied behind me. There's 27,000 people in this uh, town. Oh, wow. So it's pretty, it's, though it's a small town, it's pretty large. Uh, and this is including like the, the farm farmers and all that stuff. That's 27,000. So mm. in that city, there's probably like 12, like in the specific, okay. you know what I mean? Yeah. In the um, city, 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 yeah. city. So, um, you know, I decide, you know what, I need to make more money because I want to provide an amazing life for my daughter. So I go into water treatment and it is just an extremely hard job. Uh, it's similar to what I was doing in the military, but it's just requiring me like an insane, uh, requiring so much from me. And now we had our two daughters. So we mm. added one more, which was like the best thing that happened to us. And um, he moves to Dallas. And so I stayed in Dodge City, Kansas. And wow. I've stayed and I've been there since 2016. Wow. And I don't see myself ever leaving. I love that you place. You love it. Yeah. That's awesome. It's, it's great. And so after I realized, like, you know, I don't think that, uh, I think my daughters need more of me at home. And I missed working in the community because I love, I love working in the community. I love being able to help people. I love helping the community that I live in. They were so supportive of me. Mm -hmm. And I want to give back. Yeah. And so I, uh, it was perfect timing. My dream job, I had always been involved with the chamber. Mm-hmm. I'd always been to the ribbon cuttings. I'd gotten involved as an ambassador. Like it was just, uh, you know, once I went into the chemical treatment world, I had to leave all that stuff behind because I was constantly traveling. Mm -hmm. So I missed that. And then the director position at the chamber becomes available. And I was like, that's it. Like I need to apply. I think it was posted for a minute. And I like quickly like drafted up probably the worst resume ever. And, uh, you know, I was able to get an interview there and it worked out nicely. That's and so awesome. now, um, you know, I'm, I, we have a committee of people that plan the Dodge City Days mm -hmm. and it's a 10 day festival. It brings in over a million dollars for our economy and we have a rodeo, nice. the Dodge City, you know, Dodge City Rodeo. And so it's huge. It's very popular. Everyone in Southwest, in the Midwest, they love it. Yeah. So I'm very proud to be a part of that. Awesome. And I feel like 
all of my military experience, everything that's happened, um, every little moment led up to this like yeah. aha moment for me. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome when you're when you when you're able to look back and realize this and that happened because of this. And, yeah, and, and you're happy to be where you're at right now. Oh yeah, that's, super that's happy. I feel yeah. grateful every day and. I live in like the house that I wanted to live in. I drive the car that I love, like, and my daughters, they're just so happy. Nice. And, um, you know, I, there were some times in my life where I didn't even envision that. And then when I had my daughters, I was like, and I was getting divorced and one was like six months old. I was like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? Yeah. And honestly, everything that I learned in the military really helped me out. That's and it awesome. really helped me create this life for my children that mm. I could be proud of. What would you say, we're going to get ready to wrap it up. Um, I just have one more question. Just what would you say to, um, you know, other uh, service members transitioning out of the military or um, that plan on getting out and not making the military yeah. their career to make their transition uh, kind of smooth, as smooth as possible maybe? Um, to make your transition as smooth as possible, I think you'd always should have a plan, mm -hmm. a plan of action, you know, develop what you envision for yourself and, you know, I guess study what it takes to get there. Uh, don't let things distract you. Um, you know, people are going to tell you, oh, you're not going to do it. What are you going to do after the military? There's so many different options. There's, a, and you don't have to have a degree to do well. Um, it's always encouraged uh, and so a lot of people are afraid to get out because they don't have their degree yet um, But they just can't you know, they're miserable because they want to do other things They're they're you know ready to move on to the next phase in their life um, my My advice to them is to stick to what you want to do and make sure that you have a plan uh, have some money set aside because that is the driving factor for stress is money um, you don't want to be stressed out when you're trying to transition mm -hmm. and just, you know, stick to your plan, um, no matter what it takes, like, and it, it gets easier. It looks like it's hard at first and it's kind of scary, but once you go in and you're living your life the way you envision, and maybe it doesn't go exactly how you plan, but you're still making progress towards your goal, just stay, stick with it. Mm -hmm. Uh, like I don't let negative people, you know, stray away from that because yeah. there will be tons of people that don't want you to get out. And it's because they usually are too afraid to get out themselves. Misery loves company. Yep. Doesn't it? And so uh, don't let those people have any yeah. influence in your in your uh, future plans. Yeah, it's the same thing here. When you get out uh, and you have a plan to do uh, to accomplish a, a specific goal, mm -hmm. um, consistency is key. It gets boring. It gets monotonous, and it yeah. sucks. And you, everybody's always looking for that instant new gratification. Um, but if you just stay consistent with what you're going after, there's no way to fail yep. unless you just quit, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah. You're so. always going to, if you, you know, you'll, you'll always get to where you want to go yeah. or where you're meant to be. Right. So yeah, just, if you want to transition out and if you want to, you know, do what you want to do, don't let anybody deter you from right. that. Awesome. Uh, thanks for being here, Carla. Thank you for having me. It was yeah. great. Thank I appreciate you. it. Appreciate <laughs> it. Push it to the limit. I can't go no more.